great opportunity for me, a unique audience for me to speak to. I'm really uh, excited about this. Um, I'm not going to be talking about, uh, there's a little bit of bait and switch. Um, I think uh, it was advertised by the outlook for US monetary policy. Um, it's not going to be about that. Um, it is going to be about some of the challenges I see us facing in monetary policy um, really over the next five to 10 years or possibly beyond that and sort of the interaction between fiscal policy and monetary policy and how, uh, uh, the choices fiscal policy makers make and the, the challenges we face as central bankers. So my remarks are going to be divided into three parts. In the first part of the talk, I'm going to examine the behavior of the yields to uh, treasury inflation protected securities, tipped bonds, and the yields to uh, nominal treasuries over the past decade. So when you look at that evidence, what I'm going to try to argue is that over that period of time, there's been a notable uh, decline in the long run neutral real interest rate. And I'll talk more about what I mean by the neutral real interest rate. I'm sure it's familiar to, to everyone in this room, but just to fix terms, I'm going to mean the real interest rate that I expect to prevail when the economy is at max employment and inflation is at the central bank's target. In the second part of my talk, I'm going to discuss two costs associated with the decline in the long run neutral real interest rate. And the first cost is there's an increased risk of monetary policymakers hitting the zero lower bound. And uh, actually, I should say more correctly, it's, uh, the lower bound on the nominal interest rate. Learn that zero may not be that lower, uh, lower bound. And the second cost is that there's an increased risk of financial instability. Finally, I discuss how fiscal policy could be, could be used to increase the long run neutral real interest rate. And I'll consider a permanent increase in the market value of the public debt that'll be serviced by either be an increase in future taxes or a reduction in future transfers. So this policy change increases the supply of assets available to investors. And then I argue that in a wide class of plausible economic models, when you increase the supply of assets in that way, it's going to push downward on debt prices and so upward on the long run neutral real interest rate. So when I put these three points together, I reach my main conclusion which is the decline in the long run neutral real interest rate increases the likelihood of financial instability and the likelihood that the economy will run into the lower bound on nominal interest rates. But fiscal policy makers have the ability to mitigate uh, these risks by choosing to maintain higher levels of public debt than markets currently anticipate that they will. So I want to be clear at the outset that I'm not saying that it's appropriate for fiscal policy makers to increase the long run level of public debt. I'm pointing out two key benefits with doing so. I'm also going to point out the costs and other benefits with the increase in the level of public debt. Sorting through all of these is outside the scope of my remarks today and really outside my purview as a monetary policy maker. Um, the Fed is given a tremendous amount of independence um, as monetary policy makers. I think with that comes the arrangement that we don't tell fiscal policy makers how to make their choices. My remarks today are going to reflect my own views and are not necessarily those of others in the uh, Federal Reserve System. So uh, due to our late arrival, we have sort of a tight turnaround as well. But I'm, uh, I anticipate that we'll have a, a fair amount of time for questions after I'm done speaking. And I, I, I look forward to entertaining your questions. <coughs> OK, so I'm going to begin with some context. What do I mean by the neutral real interest rate? So, as I, I stated in the introduction, I, I'm going to use that term to refer to the real interest rate that would prevail if the, employment, if the economy were at maximum employment and inflation were at target. Now, this is the neutral real interest rate is, is a latent variable. It's unobservable. But it's nonetheless a critical variable for monetary policy makers. The goal of the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, is to achieve maximum employment and to keep inflation at target um, uh, uh, which we've identified as 2% over the longer run. Definitionally, we can only achieve these, these twin goals by ensuring the market real interest rate is, in fact, equal to the neutral real interest rate over the longer run. We're going to hit maximum employment over the longer run. We're going to be at target in terms of inflation over the longer run. Then it's got to be true that the neutral real interest rate is equal to the market real interest rate over the longer run. If the market real interest rate was expected to be too high relative to the neutral real interest rate. The FOMC is providing insufficient accommodation. In, in such a case, I would generally expect 
uh, the inflation rate to run below target and employment to be below its maximum level. Now, as I say, the neutral real interest rate is unobserved. But I think there's valuable information about the expected neutral real interest rate in the behavior of observed real interest rates and inflation <coughs> forecasts. So I next turn how best to use that information. So we're going to go to market data and, and there's, I think, valuable information in that market data about what uh, investors anticipate the, the neutral real interest rate to be. So I'm first going to just look at not the neutral real interest rate, but the real interest rate itself, the market data on the, on the, on, uh, on the neutral real rate. And my first point is that this has declined um, considerably over the longer run, over the, over the last few years. So the way I'm going to get at this, I'm going to look at 10-year, um, 10-year forward tips yields. So these are the 10-year ten ten forward yield on Treasury inflation protected securities. This is a measure of what the of what financial markets expect the annual real interest rate to average over the 10-year period that would start 10 years from when the, uh, the bonds would be traded, and then um, between that date and 10 years after that. So really the long run, right? Now if we go back to the period between the second half of 2004 and uh, the beginning of the, fi uh, the financial crisis, really it starts even before the recession, let's say, uh, so right around here, you know, you look at that and it's averaging, I, I, I'm going to, you know, this is, uh, some, it's varying, of course, but it's varying somewhere between 2 and 2.5%. Two and That's what I, I see in this chart. Now, over the past year, it's averaged below 1.5%. Uh, as of September 1st, uh, it's 1.43%. So what you see here is the blue line is this daily, the numbers from daily, and then the the red line is smoothing that out by taking a 100-day average. So there's not, not, nothing really uh, going on. But the main point to take away, I think, is this is big relative to this. That's what I'm trying to, trying to say to you. And the, the gap is something on the order of 100 to 150. No, excuse me. So, uh, it's a, uh, a, a misspoke there. I would say something on the order of 50 to 75 days, something like that. On my depressed days, I think it's bigger than that, but then it's more. Say it's not Now, there are at least um, two possible reasons that we see that this decline in market real rates. The first is that the long run neutral real estate rate has declined. So, this is this unobservable latent variable has, in fact, declined. The second is that investors expect looser monetary policy conditional on an unchanged long-run neutral real interest rate. So it could be the long-run neutral real rate has, has not changed, but investors simply think that the monetary policy is going to be systematically loose relative to whatever that new, uh, neutral real rate is. So how do, how do we go, to, go about disentangling those two possible explanations? Well, I think that one way to do it is to look at what people expect to be happening with inflation. If they think monetary policy is going to be systematically too loose, then they should expect inflation to be systematically too high relative to uh, what the Federal Reserve's declared target is. And we can get information about that uh, based on the 10-year, 10-year forward tips inflation break evens. Again, the blue line represents the 10-year, 10-year forward um, break even on a daily basis in the red line smoothing that out by taking a 100 day average. Um, I think it's hard to see a, uh, that I don't believe, I think it would be very challenging to argue based on these data that investors are expecting higher inflation at this point than they did back here. So if they're expecting a higher inflation now with the, uh, the low neutral, the low observed real interest rates, you'd expect to see higher inflation break evens at this point. And in fact, I would argue the opposite is true. We've actually seen a decline inflation break even. So if anything, um, the uh, investors are actually expecting um, tighter monetary policy in the future, not looser. So I, I would conclude from these two pictures of the but the investor's expectation of long-run neutral real interest rate has declined relative to what it was before the crisis, before 2007, 
And uh, it's po declined possibly got even more than the long run uh, real interest rate itself has. So I argue this has declined you know, by something like 50, 75 basis points. If you take you know, this decline here on the inflation break evens in a, uh, as being representative of something that's going to be more persistent, uh, then you would argue, in fact, that perhaps the long run neutral real interest rate has declined even more than the observed market real interest rate has. Okay, so that's. That's my first argument that based off these two um, pieces of information, what's happened with the observed market real interest rates and what's happening with um, um, inflation break-evens, that we can conclude that there's actually been a decline in the neutral real interest rate. And now I want to talk about what the, the costs are associated with decline in the neutral real interest rate. I think the first cost is that there's a risk that monetary policy will be less effective. With a, long, a lower long-run neutral real interest rate, of the long-run federal funds rate, consistent with 2% uh, uh, inflation, consistent with um, max employment, will be correspondingly lower. So we've got the long-run neutral real interest rate, got the inflation target layer on top of that. That means that the Fed funds rate that we have to identify to, 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 that we have to hit in order to hit our targets is going to be lower. So this means that the FOMC is typically going to uh, have less monetary policy space. It's going to be more likely to be constrained uh, by the lower bound on nominal interest rates, whatever that lower bound is. Now, during our, the recent stay at the, um, the zero lower bound or the effective lower bound, uh, the FOMC has used unconventional policies like purchases of long-term assets as a way to, to generate additional monetary accommodation. So, there was a point, December 2008, where the Fed stopped lowering interest rates, and they switched to uh, substitute towards using asset purchases as a way to generate monetary combination. And I, I, my, there's certainly controversy about this, but my own reading of the available evidence is that these purchases were effective. That is, they, they uh, were supportive of prices and employment. But I think it's also clear that from the evidence that central bankers see costs associated with these unconventional policies, the uh, asset purchase programs. So uh, my own anticipation would be that given these costs, monetary policy will typically be insufficiently accommodative during periods of the nominal interest rate uh, lower bound. I think there will be an attempt to substitute, as I say, to words using asset purchase programs if uh, it persistent stays the, uh, the effect of lower bound. But I think that during those stages, during those periods where you're at the effect of lower bound, uh, the economy will typically undershoot the FOMC's inflation and employment objectives. So that's the first I, a, a cost of being at the lower bound, is that, uh, excuse me, at, at, of the decline in the long run neutral interest rate, is that the zero lower bound or the effect of lower bound will end up being binding on policy more often and as a result, the uh, Fed will undershoot its objectives for inflation and, and employment more uh, more frequently. <coughs> now, the second cost of a low long low long run neutral real interest rate has to do with incipient financial instability. So, in, in past remarks uh, going back that I've made going back to April of 2013, I've highlighted three signs of financial instability that I would expect to be associated with low real interest rates. The first is elevated asset prices. If people are, are uh, if interest rates are low, that basically means bond prices are high. If bond prices are high, we should expect all asset prices to be high. So I think that um, if you're in a period of low, uh, long run, uh, neutral real interest rates, that's going to be a period in the, for the, when the Fed is hitting its goals, hitting its price and, uh, price and employment targets, inflation and uh, employment targets, you're going to have uh, unusually high, by historical standards, asset prices. That's just arbitrage. The second is that uh, is yes, it's less typically um, identified, but is also just basic, um, I would say, finance, that if the long run neutral interest rate is low and the Fed is hitting that low target, so it's, uh, then um, you're going to typically see um, higher than historical norms in terms of volatility as well. And the argument for this is, it's a paper, an argument that uh, goes back to a paper that John Cochran had, that the argument here is simply that when interest rates are really low, 
people are really sensitive to information about the long run. When interest rates are very high, people don't care about the long run, it doesn't matter. Uh, but when interest rates are really low, they're going to pay a lot of attention to the information about the long run. So that information about the long run is certainly going to influence um, the asset prices. And so small bits of information for the long run will end up uh, moving asset prices around a lot. Okay, so I think those are the two things that we can certainly identify elevated asset prices. So a lot of people will talk about that as being in, intrinsically a sign of financial instability. Or your discussions about bubbles, et cetera. This is just something that shows up when real interest rates are low. And the other is that um, we should expect uh, elevated asset price volatility when interest rates are low as well. Now, the, the final piece is that um, with low real interest rates, I think we're likely to see a lot of merger activity. And the reason I say that is mergers are, 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 are uh, uh, ventures or initiatives which involve a lot of upfront um, uh, costs in exchange for backloaded benefits. So the people who are doing the acquisitions are paying some upfront reorganizational costs in order to get benefits. With low real interest rates, those backloaded benefits are more valuable. And so you should expect something, you know, merger waves to be associated with low real interest rate periods. So those are three consequences of low real interest rates, elevated asset prices, elevated asset price volatility, and elevated merger activity that I've identified in past remarks. I think it's, uh, you know, whether or not those are financial instability or not, you know, that, that, that's a term that actually has a lot of definitions in a lot of different places. But certainly you'll hear some uh, observers identify each of these, I think, with what they would describe as instability in financial markets. Now, other observers have emphasized additional risks to financial stability associated with low real interest rates. And uh, you know, I'm not, I won't go through all that, but there's, there's a lot of discussion about, about, about these in the, in, uh, in, uh, um, the public conversation about monetary policy, and I think you'll hear, hear uh, some of this, in, in fact, uh, later on in this, in this workshop. I think the overall implication of all these analyses, what I've offered, what others have offered, is that the decline in the, long, the, the neutral real interest rate, so this, getting this low neutral real interest rate, has the potential to create a difficult trade-off for the FOMC and for other central banks. You know, I, I'm obviously talking always from the perspective of the U.S. monetary policy. But this is something that shows up for whoever, whatever, whoever you are around the world, that you, you have a, a remit, which is going to look like something about inflation, something about the real economy, in the case of the US. And the low neutral real interest rate means you're going to have to keep the real interest rate unusually low if you're going to want to hit your price and employment objectives. On the other hand, if you keep the real interest rate low, you're also taking on these uh, increasing these risks of financial instability. That creates, I think, uh, that, well, I should say, I, I, th that risk of financial instability has, it has the potential to link back to what's happening with prices and employment. As we've seen all too clearly in the past 10 years, um, it, the, if risks to financial stability do transpire, the FOMC may not be able to achieve its price and employment objectives. As risks in financial markets can translate into adverse outcomes in pricing of current space. So then you're, you're confronted with a risk reward trade off. That if you want to keep, you, you have to, if you want to hit your targets on average, you've got to keep your goals on average, you're going to have to keep interest rates low. But keeping rates low creates risks to your ability to achieve those objectives. Okay, so all of this treats that inflation target is fixed. So I, I've acted as a 2% is hardwired and fixed. And so if you go back earlier this year, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, Eric Rosengren, suggested that the FOMC should consider increasing its inflation target. So currently at two, uh, increasing to some higher, higher level. Now, any such increase would translate into a higher long-run Fed funds rate. And this would offset the impact of a decline in the long-run neutral interest rate by giving the FOMC more policy space. So you, you, if you recall, I argued when you have a long, long run neutral real rate and you, you keep the inflation target fixed, that means you have less policy space to deal with shocks. You're more likely to run into the zero lower bound or the effect of lower bound. Um, if you raise the inflation target, you're, off, you're, you're generating more policy space for yourself to, to respond to adverse shocks. Now, I, the other piece is that raising the target for inflation 
could also be helpful in terms of mitigating some sources of financial instability. But a lot of, actually, everything I talked about was all in terms of real interest rates. And so raising the inflation target is not going to help you with any of that. But if there are types of financial instability that you could identify that are linked to nominal interest rates. So in particular, some institutional investors have target returns that are pegged in nominal terms, not in real terms. And then low nominal interest rates have the potential to provide incentives to those kinds of investors to take on undue amounts of risk. So if the interest rates are out there in the world are low and they're told they have to hit a certain target return, they're going to take on a lot of risk to be able to do that. Raising the inflation target has the benefit of lowering these incentives and thereby reducing the risk of financial instability. Now, this is all about benefits. <laughs> Increase, increasing the inflation target will also be costly in at least a couple of different ways. Uh, first, higher average inflation, as uh, this group well knows, is typically thought to have a number of economic costs, including increasing the dispersion of relative prices in the economy. I, from a central banking perspective, changing the target inflation rate could potentially weaken the credibility of any target you establish. You say, OK, we're going to raise it to three then you've got doubts now created that maybe, well, maybe you're going to raise it to four at some point down the road. And so the credibility of any target is weakened by the act of actually raising the target. So any conversation about raising the target inflation rate, um, the Federal Market Committee would have to weigh these costs against the benefits that I mentioned earlier. OK, so those are the, the two, uh, two issues I wanted to uh, my fir the first two things I want to talk about. There was a decline, there's been a decline in the long run neutral real interest rate, and this decline has two kinds of costs for, for monetary policymakers. One is it increases the risk of hitting the zero lower bound or the effect of lower bound, and it uh, increases uh, the risk of financial instability. So I now turn to my final topic, which is the nexus between this challenge for monetary policymakers and the decisions that can be made by uh, fiscal policymakers. And so I'm going to be talking about how can an increase in the level of public debt serviced by higher future taxes or lower future transfers affect the long run neutral interest rate. My analysis is going to be totally agnostic about how the government uses the funds generated by the new debt issue. So you issue some debt, you'll have some funds associated with that. But I'm more interested in sort of the long run associated with this. You've, you've issued the debt, now you've got to service it in some way. So what, how do you think about this as economists? Well, the baseline thinking about this goes back to, to work that uh, Robert Barrow did in the, late, in the early 70s, I should say. And this is his formulation of what, uh, what later became known as Ricardian equivalence. So the heart of Ricardian equivalence is that the additional issuance of public debt leads households to demand more assets in order to save for anticipated future taxes needed uh, to service that extra debt. So you issue the debt, that increases supply, but now on the other side, households are going to demand more debt. Which one wins? Well, the ultimate impact, you know, what, whatever is going to happen in terms of the neutral real interest rate is going to be determined by which the some demand effect or the supply effect wins. Under Ricard equivalence, the opposite exactly. And uh, there's no impact in the long run neutral interest rate. So if you're used to using the, the three equation representative agent model, this is your baseline way of thinking about an increase in the public debt. There's nothing, nothing can happen by just simply by doing that. But uh, there are many models of the economy in which, uh, other, in which Ricardian equivalence is not whole. And, uh, uh, well, I'll talk about them and then I'll, I'll argue for them in a moment. So in these models, those who buy the government bonds, who demand these extra assets, are not the same who, as those who will pay the future taxes. And so you don't get this exact offset. So I'll type, cite two examples of such models. The first is overlapping generations framework. It goes back to Paul Samuelson's work in the, the late 50s and Peter Diamond's work in the mid 60s. But of course, it's been a, been a workhorse for a lot of kind of work uh, since then. Now in this model, the buyers of additional debt pay only some of the taxes needed to service that debt. Because, you know, they're debt. And um, so the increase in the supply of public debt is not public completely offset by a corresponding increase in demand for the assets. 
that, uh, that uh, and so the long run neutral interest rate does rise when you issue more debt in an overlapping generations context. As, as will become clear in a second, this is not, has nothing, it's not relying on dynamic inefficiency. I want to be clear about that. This is just a, a statement about the properties of the OG model, whether you're in a dynamically efficient or dynamically inefficient uh, uh, region of the parameter space. And I'll, I'll make that clearer in a few, a few moments. But for right now, I'm just going to be saying to you that when you issue more debt in an in a, um, a overlapping generations framework, you don't get recurring equivalents in the sense of the long run neutral rate of state is, is going, to go, going to go up. Now the second kind of model, which um, has probably got been more used in research in the last uh, uh, 15 or 20 years, is the incomplete markets class of models that was pioneered by Truman Buley and then uh, uh, I think brought to full for fruition by, uh, by some of the work that Rai Agari did. Now this kind of model, at least some agents face binding borrowing constraints at any point in time. Now on the margin, any additional debt issuance will be purchased only by the unconstrained agents. Constrained agents don't want to go out and buy debt. That's not their problem in life. But all agents are going to be, at some point, required to service that, that pay, uh, pay the taxes required to service the extra debt. So again, we have an asymmetry to who's buying the debt and who's actually servicing the debt. <coughs> and that asymmetry is going to create upward pressure on the, on the, on the long-run neutral real interest rate. Now, personally, I find both the overlapping generations framework and the incomplete markets model, you can meld them together in interesting ways, and others and people have done that. Uh, I find these, these models to be more compelling as a description of the effects of debt issuance than I do the Ricardo Equivalence model. I just think the complete opposite doesn't, doesn't ring true to me as a description of what's going to happen in the world. So uh, these models imply that, uh, the models that I, I think are more plausible imply that fiscal authorities can push upward on the long run neutral interest rate by issuing more public debt. <coughs> by do, doing so, they'll reduce the risk of financial instability and, um, and the risk of less effective protective monetary policy associated with the lower bound and non interest rate. So they're going to help the monetary policy maker out by creating more monetary policy space and also reducing the risk of financial instability. Now let me say a couple of words about increasing the level of public debt. First of all, this is not the same as the asset purchase program. What I'm talking about is not quantitative easy. The purchase programs that the Fed has done, uh, uh, that did over the past few years, what the Fed did is bought by long-term assets that were issued or backed by the Treasury of the United States. Now, that purchase sounds like you're reducing the level of public debt. But how did the Fed pay for that? It increased, it paid for those by increasing the level of bank reserves. What are bank reserves? Though bank reserves, should, you should be thinking about those as just another liability of the government. Um, they're, they're essentially floating rate perpetuities. So that's, that's basically what a bank reserve is. So it's just a swap of, of one kind of asset, or a kind of a liability, I should say, from the government for a minute. So the Fed's intervention left the market value of outstanding uh, federal government liabilities unchanged. We're, we operate in an open market, it's the name of the market committee. And so the market value of the assets we gave up is equal to the market value of the assets we bought. So this is, the, this is really a, 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 a the long-term asset purchase program is a shift in the maturity structure of outstanding government liabilities. Now, I think there's, it's interesting to think about how that affects the long-run neutral real estate. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is simply a change in the market value of, of, of government obligations and how that affects the long run neutral interest rate. That's conceptually and, and practically distinct from uh, um, what the Fed did. Now, the second point I want to make, and it harkens back to what I said at the very beginning, is I talk about the benefits of increasing the level of public debt. And it does, this is, just because I point to benefits doesn't mean I'm arguing in favor of extra debt issuance. Models with their out equivalents typically imply they're winners and losers with extra debt issuance. For example, if you think about the OG model, the overlapping generation model I talked through, uh, many would argue that the most plausible parameterizations for this model are dynamically efficient. That is, the long-run neutral interest rate is higher than the growth rate. 
It's still true in these parameterizations, as it is for, for the dynamically inefficient ones, that increasing the level of public debt pushes upward on the long run neutral real interest rate. But in and of itself, in this dynamically efficient region, pushing up on the level of public debt pushes upward on the neutral, uh, excuse me, in and of itself, the associated increase of debt service makes all generations worse off. We knew that in a dynamically efficient region, issuing more debt is not a cradle improvement. In fact, it makes all generations worse off, except potentially the initial one. You might be using the money to give them some, you know, <laughs> you know pay, pay, give them some money. The question is whether or not this particular welfare loss, which is going to be just you have to pay the debt service, the taxes <coughs> to pay the debts off, um, into the infinite future, whether that's outweighed by the welfare gains associated with reducing the risk of financial stability, I pointed to earlier, or the risk of ineffective monetary policy, I pointed to earlier. And then you have to figure out uh, which, one, which one's winning. Now this tension that emerges in the models is actually a very real one, I think. So it, 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 I trust it won't happen in this one, but in many of my appearances, retired older individuals come up to me and express concern to me about the low yields that they're, they're getting on their portfolios. Actually happens when I visit my family. Um, so if the federal government were to issue more public debt, the neutral rule interstate would rise. And the FOMC would be in a position to raise the Fed funds rate target more rapidly. Okay, so the Fed were to issue, I mean, the uh, Treasury were to issue more public debt, or fiscal authority, more correctly, were to issue more public debt, that would push up in the long run neutral rule interstate. And that would mean that the, the, in order to achieve our objectives of, of inflation and employment, we would have to maintain higher uh, yields on, on, all, its, on all, 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 uh, uh, all, all, all assets. So a public debt increase would help retired older savers, which is the initial hold in the overlapping generations construct. <laughs> but this step is not without costs. If you increase the level of public debt, thereby increasing the yields that, uh, that uh, debt is paying, younger workers and those who are yet to be born are going to have to pay the taxes to service that debt. Or they're going to the transfer programs that are being financed with them will have to be cut. Balancing these gains versus losses is just not a job for a monetary policymaker to do. It's a job for the fiscal authority to sort through and, and, and figure out what, uh, what's the right way, what the right way to go on that is. So let me wrap up by summarizing my argument one last time, then I'll be happy to take, uh, take questions. So there's been a significant decline in the long run neutral real interest rate in the United States over the past uh, few years. Uh, the decline of the, of the long run neutral real estate increases the future likelihood that the FOMC will be unable to achieve its objectives because of financial instability or because of a binding lower bound on the nominal interest rate. Economic models that I see as plausible imply that the fiscal authority can mitigate this problem by issuing more public debt, but such issuance is not without cost. And as I've emphasized several times in this talk, Sorting through these costs and benefits is the province of the fiscal authority, uh, not mine. And, uh, but uh, as it, uh, what I've done is point to some benefits and highlighted those that I think are underappreciated, and then those are weighted against the cost of, of increased debt service. Thank you very much for your attention. As I said, I'm happy to.